I'm Ewa Messer. I'm the producer and host of Poured Over. And Ned Blackhawk is a professor of history and American studies at Yale University. He's also the most recent winner of the National Book Award for The Rediscovery of America, Native Peoples, and the Unmaking of U.S. History. And Ned very nicely cleared out some time on his calendar for us because he won the National Book Award two weeks ago, and now we're taping. So, Ned, thank you so much for making the time. It's great to see you. I'm really happy to be with you. So I have a question for you, and I want to start with Native Peoples in the subtitle of the book, because we've heard American Indian, Native American, Indigenous Peoples. You use Native Peoples not only in the subtitle, but throughout the book. And I just want to make sure I'm using the right nomenclature as we go forward. Yes, uh, these are somewhat interchangeable kind of political and social categories uh, used to describe the Indigenous Peoples of the United States, broadly speaking, in North America as well. Native peoples has come into a particular fashion and parlance with the rise of contemporary Native nations. I could have used the term Native nations in the unmaking of U.S. history. And there was some kind of stylistic questions about having the term American twice in the title and in the subtitle. So American Indians, Native nations, and Native peoples, and Indigenous Americans are commonly uh, interchangeable, sometimes terms for describing what historically and even legally are often called Indians. 500 years of American history. You start with the Spaniards coming in in you know 1500s. And we get up to what we call the American century. And you and I are just going to hit some of the really big points. There's a piece about the Civil War that's driving a large part of your narrative that I hadn't actually thought about. I mean, when I think about the mythology of the opening of the American West, right? Like, obviously, terrible, terrible things happen. This is a big piece of the book. But the Civil War puts an interesting context to Native people's history in the U.S. And I know it sounds like I'm jumping in right into the middle of the book, and I kind of am. But I do want to start there because I feel like the Civil War is a piece of American history that a lot of us have feelings about, or at least have been taught, have some experience of, and it just seems like, okay, let's use that as context. Uh, yeah. And, you know, from a lot of academic uh, historians, myself included, uh, we're often either on a semester system or a kind of organizational yearly calendar where American history might be taught in two halves at many uh -huh. schools. So at UC Berkeley or University of Wisconsin Madison, where I used to teach, uh, you know, history 101 is American history to the Civil War, and history 102 is American history since the Civil War. And that demarcation is illustrative of the centrality this subject and this history has on the making of America more broadly. We all kind of, I think, know that as kind of um, American citizens on some level. Ken Burns did a great deal to bring kind of larger national attention to the Civil War as the kind of defining crucible of America. But with our understandings of early America and the challenges around the early republic, there are other social constituents, there are other populations, there are other peoples in, in, in my field, nations who are impacted by this field who have been relegated to the margins. And so my Civil War chapter in the book does try to broaden our frame of analysis to look at these other central dimensions to a war that had just inestimable influence upon the American continent. History was my thing in college, but obviously you're the trained historian, I'm the bookseller, so bear with me as I sort of noodle around this conversation. But it feels fair to say that really Westward expansion, as we were taught and as we know it now, really was kicked off in sort of the wake of the Civil War. Am I right about that? That land grabs sort of really took off in a way in the late 1800s that maybe previously had not? The Civil War made the expansion of the United States a more political, legal, and kind of jurisdictionally legible process. Okay. Prior to the Civil War, 1860, 1858, even in the Civil War era itself, the presence of the federal government is negligible across most of the trans-Mississippi West. 
And part of the reason there's so many battles and wars with Native nations is many Indians or Native leaders don't believe that the white settlers and their leaders are as powerful as they say they are because they've watched conflicts among settlers. They've watched Confederate leaders leave Western posts. They hear that this battle or this war is kind of coming. They don't see the evidentiary you know, examples that we think of as modern America. There are no continental railroad. The U.S. military is, you know, 20,000 soldiers in 1860, you know, a fraction of what it would be just two years later, uh, let alone five years later. There are very limited forts and other kind of well-institutionalized uh, centers of essentially uh, state power. The Civil War changes all of that very quickly and very dramatically. And so even though the United States had claimed, obviously, California in 1850 or um, incorporated much of the northern half of Mexico during the U.S. war with Mexico, uh, much of the American West and places like, you know, Wyoming, Nevada, Arizona, you know, are hardly incorporated into the body politic of the republic. So when you accepted your National Book Award for nonfiction, you opened your remarks with a really great line. And it's from the introduction to the book. I love this line, so I'm just going to quote you for a second. How can a nation founded on the homelands of dispossessed indigenous peoples be the world's most exemplary democracy? And part of why I love that line is I grew up outside of Boston. So the whole city on the hill, Plymouth Plantation, first Thanksgiving, hi. That was something that was sort of drilled into me from the time I was very small. And every fall, we would take a school trip to Plymouth Plantation. Every single... At one point, there was even an animatronic Squanto. It was Massachusetts a very long time ago, and I have no idea if there's still an animatronic hall of anything. But it's a fundamental myth of the founding of America, right? Like, here we are. We are the city on the hill. And we've left out an entire population and you're rectifying it in a way with this book you're starting to at least right I, I am part of a generation or two of academic and tribal scholars who have been you know making lots of inroads and so this book would not have been possible without the vast work of countless others whom I whom I built upon and so the title the Discovery of America really is a recognition that scholars and tribal members and allies and others are in a process of rediscovering this missing piece, if you if we want to call it. There's a lot that remains to be done, but a lot has been achieved to the point where one, we can begin to ask that type of question. Uh, there's a lot of uh, what I call calcified resistance or sedimented forms of knowledge that limit engagement with these subjects, and it is a lot easier to uh, just kind of inhabit a kind of prior kind of received wisdom on certain subjects and to live and work and teach in ways that are more familiar and perhaps comforting. And the reason that story of American democracy in the kind of triumphalist way is so in institutionalized is because of the comfort it provides. There's a kind of a safety and a kind of a intellectual home, essentially, particularly for descending communities particularly Euro-American immigrant uh, uh, societies who have found, you know, uh, often sanction and various forms of uh, sanctuary and other types of uh, mobilities, liberties and opportunities that have made the American dream, and uh, not just for Euro-Americans, but for, you know, countless millions of others, um, a reality that many project upon an understanding of history that is not, I think, super helpful. Right. You have been a professor for 20 years now? I'm in my 25th year of teaching. Okay, 25th year of teaching. Did your undergrad work at McGill in Canada. Then where did you do your grad work? There was some time in California, right? Right. I started graduate school with a master's degree at the University of California, Los Angeles. Okay. What I consider to be one of the most kind of advanced intellectual communities around American historical subjects. And then I didn't have a kind of sufficient mentoring uh, kind of relationship with an academic advisor and ended up at the University of Washington, where I worked with a field leader. Okay. So when you were coming up, starting your career in the academy, 
was Native American studies defined? Did you have to cobble together your program from American studies and American history, or were you able to work in the way you wanted to work with the material you wanted to work with? Because it feels like this is almost an emerging discipline, even though you've been teaching for 25 years. Right. And I've, I've witnessed the rise of this disciplinary okay. formation. And there are now like professional organizations that didn't okay. exist 15 years ago. There are journals that weren't there. And perhaps most excitingly, there are lots of colleagues, graduate students and undergraduates uh, doing fantastic work in this field. And I'm really, you know, fortunate to remember, in a sense, uh, these earlier worlds and periods when it was very difficult to find um, course materials. Even mm-hmm. that's why uh, one of the imperatives behind this book was to offer a robust overview of U.S. history with a particular uh, indigenous theme or valence, and it also explains part of its organization, so that you can't ignore Native peoples from either the contemporary period or the 19th century or the 20th. Um, and so it makes this kind of early rhetorical claim that every century of American history is an indigenous history as well. And I'm kind of committed to that argumentation and I have yet to have anyone try to disabuse me of that subject. But the 20th century is the field that most consistently has failed to see Native peoples in as part of the mosaic of multicultural America. But the discipline of Native American studies and the people within it are really rectifying and kind of re-energizing uh, conversations about democracy, dispossession, colonialism, and other uh, themes of indigeneity that um, are starting to become particularly resonant. And one of the kind of surprising developments of the last 20 years is this paradigm of settler colonialism come part of the parlance of kind of contemporary social and cultural affairs in ways that, you know, academics never see their work kind of translated into public form uh, in in those ways. Right. And also, I do want to bring up the evolution of history and how we teach it and how we tell these stories. If you think about, for instance, narratives that Francis Parkman was writing, you know, back in the day and the way he interpreted events in the American West. And when we look back now and, well, it's impossibly dated. And the idea that, you know, history is a static thing, right? That we know what our history is. Well, actually, no, history reflects who we are, right? I mean, it's its own discipline. And I kind of stumbled upon some of these insights in the post-Civil War chapters of this book. I was just kind of shocked to kind of, I knew as a kind of professionally trained historian that American history as a kind of field didn't really exist until the late 19th century, that even into the early 20th century, most uh, academic institutions, such as Yale, where I now teach and work, uh, would not have sullied themselves with a vision of American history and and the kind of way that we would think of it. And it was these kind of field leaders in the late 19th and early 20th century who helped kind of initiate kind of themes of analysis like the frontier Mm -hmm. or Oscar Hanlon's immigration theses, uh, later more 20th century uh, scholars like Perry Miller, who had the vision of American exceptionalism from his studies of the Puritan world, those kind of paradigms have kind of often uh, kind of clouded their own histories. And Parkman, who is a Brahmin, you know, from Boston, uh, you know, he he and so many others are writing about an earlier pre-national world because of the effect of the Civil War upon the nation. They're trying to understand what are the defining elemental kind of attributes of an American identity or society or history in the aftermath of so much suffering and destruction and uh, loss of life. And so they go back and they create these myths of French colonialism in Parkman's case or Puritanism in Mm -hmm. the subsequent histories of others. And it's in that period when national holidays like Thanksgiving and Columbus Day and others start emerging that have kind of, you know, clouded really the actual histories of these periods and simplified in my uh, field or um, for my interests, uh, Native peoples within them. One of the points that you're making throughout Rediscovery, too, is, and I'm just, again, I'm just going to quote you here because for a historian, you have really great style. (laughs) This is just fun to read this book. Encounter rather than discovery must structure America's origin story. I mean, that's essentially what you're saying is we're not even using the right language to describe 
what's happened to us. Like we have to change at a very, very basic level. And I do, I want to parse the definition of encounter and, and put that up against discovery because this is the story of America, right? Like we were discovered by Europeans and they civilized us and blah, 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 all of this kind of thing. But encounter actually changes the playing field entirely. It does. And because in part, because it, in discovery has inherently a kind of action of either arrival or consciousness or some kind of a signatory beginning. And, you know, it could be a Colombian encounter. It could be uh, Vespucci. It could be Verrazano. It could be Henry Hudson. It could be Jacques Cartier or Samuel de Champlain. It could be any of these kind of uh, moments, you know. Um, it could be the Plymouth colonists uh, doing their Mayflower compact off the, you know, off the coast of Cape Cod. It could be any of these moments become the beginning, essentially, of a process of formation that then extends into a seemingly absent or wilderness or some kind of a un a historical landscape. Encounter requires us to see beyond that periodization, beyond that kind of simplified focus, beyond an exclusive uh, exclusionary vision, essentially, and and hopefully invites us to name these exclusions to understand these kind of formations um, to not abandon them, but at least understand that when we say America, we're not describing a landscape that was named as such at the time of European arrival, right? Uh, that there were other names for the region, that there were other peoples here, that they had other practices, and it puts American history less on a kind of a teleological process of expansion and or celebration and puts it in a, just a more kind of complex and undetermined narrative. It's so interesting to me that there are people who, when they encounter a sort of historical narrative and they want it to stay sort of what their perception of the narrative is and not give it space to evolve and not give it space to, to change as our understanding of society and culture changes with it, you use the Constitution sort of as the midpoint of the book, the writing of the U.S. Constitution. And it's very deliberate. It's, you know, that marks sort of the start of the Republic, right? The Republic, our nation, as we know it. And the two pieces of this book hang together really well, but it is, it's a really sharp division. And I'm wondering if you could take a minute and talk about that a little bit. Most Americans, uh, myself included, receive very kind of partial understandings of the chronology and development of the U.S. nation state. Even in those kind of surveys that I referenced earlier, the revolution receives far more generally uh, analysis and attention than does its aftermath. Right. And because the aftermath of the revolution is so uncertain and I don't want to say mismanaged, but um, there are just inescapable problems that plague the United States at the time of its independence. Can you give an example? Because we we focus so much on the taxation piece and actually right. you come out and say it and it's like, well, actually, that wasn't the only driving force. And yet that really has become the metaphor, right, for uh, events leading up to the American Revolution. It's like, well, you know, that's not all of it. Yeah, I mean, in the revolution, the examples that I point to are interior struggles between native peoples and British and settlers, as well as the British crown. In the post-revolutionary period, um, it, the Articles of Confederation, which uh, govern the Continental Congress during the uh, revolution um, and then the early years of the Republic, just lacks the kind of capacity for military organization. Uh, it's essentially any form of kind of interstate or national political activities. Um, and so the Constitution really begins our kind of modern American political system. And I think we all know that, but we've never really sufficiently, I think, spent enough time in that space. And for Native peoples who are mentioned both in the Declaration and in the Constitution, these are obviously extremely uh, determinative periods. Right. And one can get a kind of clear understanding, I think, of this constitutional period into the sixth chapter, which concludes part one, and also prepares one for the subsequent 
half of the book in which the law of American governance for Indian peoples becomes a particularly signature feature of 19th and 20th century American history. It's very complicated, uh, but incredibly important, particularly because so many lawyers are taught American legal history and law without these subjects in them. And so many like Supreme Court justices, you know, have just simply never really encountered some of these subjects, despite going to the best academic schools in the country, because it's not taught there. Um, and so I think someone could kind of come into an understanding of American kind of legal and political history through this realm quite sufficiently, or kind of at least introductorily, in ways that might be helpful or and or surprising. I felt like I learned so much from the second half of the book. I mean, the way I was taught American history in high school, and my specialty ended up being East Asian history. So I really did sort of got through AP European history, did American history, and then never felt fully grounded in sort of the minutiae of it, because that felt like the minutiae, a lot of what we now know was sort of reserved for college level coursework. Mm -hmm. And I really, I needed to take some time with, I didn't quite realize that, say, you talk about the development of social groups and advocacy in the 1920s. And I didn't realize that that had been happening at quite that level or that the U.S. government early on was using treaties with Indian nations to sort of practice writing treaties with the English and the French. And you right. talk about how we really have created our country as we know it through our interactions with Native peoples. And it's a whole new way to think about things. The argument for that claim is stronger for the antebellum period. Okay. But I try, to, I try to extend it throughout the 19th and even into the 20th century. It's saying things like essentially how the United States treats its most vulnerable citizens reflects broadly on the nation as a whole. And if we can't see that as a kind of elemental kind of commitment of American democracy and justice, then we're not really understanding those subjects either. And so uh, the treaty thing is really interesting because uh, there's a lot of evidence um, that the founders really were struggling to make sense of their authority and their their very like limited constitutional precedents for doing the things they needed to do very early, uh, like purchase Louisiana. And it's not mm -hmm. just for Indians there, but there were thousands of non-Anglophone settlers there, people who were from the French Empire, previously of the Spanish Empire. And uh, the U.S., you know, wasn't, you know, the U.S. constitutional system wasn't organized to incorporate new peoples in this form. Right. So Jefferson thought an amendment might be needed. Um, he was, but he was against like centralized federalist authority before that, before he was president, that is. And so his evolution on and thinking on these matters is like super transformative from his initial entry into uh, national politics to his eventual, you know, two-term uh, presidency. And so he's, living through this era of evolution in which international affairs, uh, slave uprisings like in Haiti, Napoleon's invasions of Spain that lead to the kind of eventual uh, um, purchase of Louisiana are all kind of uh, happening so quickly. Uh, and Native peoples are at the heart of all of these imperial um, developments. Um, if not in Europe, certainly in not just North America, but even the Caribbean, because uh, Haiti is rebelling against um, its French masters, and Napoleon is essentially starting to diminish what had once been the prospects of Black liberation for former slaves, uh, because he wants to turn North America back into a French breadbasket or kind of an imperial hinterland for their Haitian uh, plantations, which he envisions will regain French and imperial authority, which it had lost during the Seven Years' War. So there's a lot of things happening that we've kind of, um, we lose sight of if we focus exclusively on small geographic areas or sets of individual leaders and or their publications. You've been working in this field 
you know, again, as you said earlier, this is your 25th year teaching. You've been studying this material for much longer, as long as you possibly have been able to, but are you still in a place where you can surprise yourself? I mean, is that where the new research and the new work is helping? All the time. And that's kind of why um, I'm so delighted to be um, having this conversation with you and to be in this kind of space, because a lot of the insights from that, from the, uh, the book, uh, were particularly revelatory. I have been teaching, at, or I've been a faculty member for 25 years uh-huh. and teaching Native American history almost all of those years. I was in graduate school, uh, but in the academy, we're, we're trained to be specialists and examine new subjects or materials. And um, I've been largely a kind of Western American historian up mm-hmm. until recent years. Uh, but this project has kind of forced me to be kind of become a generalist. And so I've kind of had to learn things about American history that, that I wouldn't otherwise have learned. And at every stage, it's just been fascinating to see this subject, which has so consistently been, you know, shoved aside or ignored or not included at the heart of, you know, so many kind of elemental moments. And so we were, you started with the Civil War, and I was just astounded that Lincoln was literally drafting the Emancipation Proclamation as the uh, largest mass execution in U.S. history was being conducted under his jurisdiction and with his moderate moderate level of consent in December of 1862. I mean, we've never seen those subjects together. And the most U.S. political historians of that moment and of that of those eras have a fairly exclusive focus on Eastern North America or on the North and the South or on Black-White race relations and have yet to been able to really see the West and indigenous peoples as also participants in the American crucible. So those are surprising. You know, at times there's a kind of disappointment that it's so understudied or underrecognized. But if you see this as an invitation or an opportunity, rediscovery can become a great process of engagement that really can be very fulfilling. We don't lose anything by becoming more inclusive in the way we tell our stories, especially about our nation. We just, we don't lose anything. It just adds another layer. I mean, I didn't know that the 1890 census too had said the frontier is officially closed. I was like, well, how can you say that the frontier is closed? And I realize it's a technical designation, but the way we hold on to that idea, right, of the American West and the freedom and all of the things it represents. And, you know, I'm going to go build my fortune. All of these second sons, right, who left the East Coast because they had nothing to inherit and went West and they were like, well, I'm going to make my fortune. And the Huntington Museum out here in California, you know, has this entire sort of wing filled with art from upstate New York and New England and whatnot. And I'm like, you know, I thought I didn't have to see that necessarily anymore. And it's a certain kind of art that works for a certain kind of person. And that's great. But it's amazing to me sometimes when I think about it, that all of that followed us out kind of thing. And even in that context of I'm going to build a new thing, I'm going to escape my past, and yet I'm going to bring the portraits along. And I'm going to bring all of this kind of art that represents everything that I left behind. And I still, even now, I sort of wrestle with that a little bit. But for me, that's also the fun of reading history, right? Especially something that I'm not particularly well-versed in. So to hear a historian say, well, yes, I can still surprise myself because there are stories to be discovered is pretty exciting. Yeah, I think, you know, most academic historians don't uh, become academic historians for uh, clear, you know, objectives. It's kind of a process of engagement um, that comes from a a hunger or kind of a calling or some kind of impetus. You know, it is challenging. um, Like, you know, my mom was a public school teacher for many decades and you know, be, you know, there are challenges to these vocations that uh, are often unanticipated or, or foreseen. But the like the spark one gets from inquiry or the excitement you get sharing ideas in classes or with students or at conferences, those are kind of uh, incredibly kind of generative things. I would say there is a kind of potential challenge in that we are both in the academy, but also now uh, because of social media outside of in the educational institutions, we're saturated with knowledge. 
and you know and often kind of presented in somewhat of an argumentative or kind of imperative form like we must know this now and we must kind of re-educate ourselves on these subjects and that challenge is a kind of bewildering one and fatiguing one and i don't think i have any like real remedies uh but i would kind of just say that one of my worries is that we've become so specialized uh, we that we're losing sight of the forest uh, from the trees that we're learning more and more about less and less sometimes as, as scholars and historians. So I'm not going to say that this book um, is doing anything that uh, different from others, but in attempt to bring synthesis and uh, argumentative um, interpretive uh, conclusions or interpretations more broadly into form, I think we can kind of come to see new uh, kind of common paradigms or common understandings emerge that not necessarily uh, replace others, but d d limit their influence. So uh, Puritanism has kind of fallen from the like the mantle of early American history. Slavery kind of challenged it in the 70s and 80s and 90s that, you know, New England used to be the exclusive center of early America. Uh, now something called borderlands history has kind of replaced a focus on British North America. And so you can see in this book uh, those kind of recognitions and indebtedness. Uh, but there still is an entire chapter on essentially British settlement in New England and kind of understanding that you can't talk about the history of the United States without talking about the revolution and the Constitution. So it's not like this is a, you know, a alternative history of the United States, perhaps a just, as you said, maybe more expanded. You grew up in Detroit. And wait, you went to Catholic high school, too? I did. Yeah. So you're Western Shoshone. Do I have that right? Yes. OK. So how do you end up in Detroit? How did your parents leave the West and bring you to the Midwest? And then you sort of. My parents met in Detroit in the late. Oh, OK. OK. And my dad is from uh, Nevada and our tribe and family are kind of rooted there. So it is kind of a you know, I do have a kind of uncommon biography like many of us. My Life is like many uh, American Indians of my age, whose parents either uh, migrated. Uh, the, it was the policy of the United States to urbanize Indians throughout the Cold War era. My dad did not formally go through that, but um, uh, was in and around like urban Indian uh, communities in Michigan, where I'm from. So it's not as uncommon as it might seem, but we 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 just have yet to kind of really think through uh, kind of modern America from these communities' perspectives often. Yeah. Can you just explain for listeners who might not know what the urbanization policy was about? Can we just talk about that for a second? Because I think it's really important, and I think we do, in a way, need to figure out how to have that, not right the second, but how to have that conversation. Because it does, when you look at U.S. policy towards Native peoples and reservations and systemic issues and, you know, the Bureau of Indian Affairs and all of these kinds of things, the idea that urbanization was a policy is, I think, unique for your community. Yeah, I think um, I haven't th thought a lot comparatively about this particular subject, but it relates to, obviously, the kind of constitutional and political distinctiveness that Native nations and reservation lands have historically right. And so when the United States, you know, there's a joke in Indian country that when Congress sneezes, Indians end up in the hospital. And so every time Congress does something new to solve a problem with Indian affairs, it usually is done with uh, either economic austerity measure minds or kind of ideological ones. And either mm -hmm. way, uh, Indians end up suffering because mm -hmm. uh, the tribes and uh, until only recently had relatively kind of... Um, precarious kind of forms of self-sufficiency following the establishment of the reservation era. Uh, dependency on federal funding, dependency on federal foods, dependency on federal medical and educational facilities, some of which were used to either sterilize Native Americans and or get their children to other, other institutional settings. So this is an incredibly, not necessarily exclusively bleak, but at least it's a counter narrative to American political history that emphasizes uh, the expansion of liberty or the kind of the growth of, you know, opportunities and freedoms for individual citizens. Indians aren't citizens until the 20s. 
and even afterwards are kind of subject to federal policies that change regularly that include things like urbanization after the mm-hmm. or when the federal policymakers thought that Indian affairs shouldn't really essentially be part of the federal government's commitments anymore, despite two centuries almost of those types of relationships having been built. So this is kind of um, the reality of Indian country in the Cold War era, and more recently, um, a kind of not necessarily a return migration, but there's large numbers of urbanized Native Americans who have returned back to and or mm-hmm. uh, become a part of uh, tribal reservation communities, bringing with them their educational and professional trainings and using it in the service now of sovereign Native governance. It's so important, too, for people who are not on the reservation or near the reservation to understand that the systemic poverty is pretty significant. And I think that has been left out of a lot of the conversations. And certainly, like, I spend a lot of time in California. We have a lot of casinos. There are a lot of casinos on the East Coast, too. And that has changed the equation for some people, but it's not consistent. And it's not right. across the board. It's only certain communities. You know, we see the buses and I hope everyone has a good time doing their thing. But it's really interesting to me the way that we just keep holding on to what you are calcified, these ideas that are calcified. And, well, and, and, and gaming is a relatively recent historical phenomenon. It is. Mm-hmm. You know, I, you and I probably uh, have lived through in ways that we remember pretty clearly this not having been present in our communities or lives uh, or regions. It's it's not well known, but part of its origins lie with the federal government's defunding of Indian affairs throughout the early Reagan era. Reagan and David Stockman and other economic advisors decided to radically reduce the federal government's commitments outside of military affairs to federal initiatives of various kinds. And tribes at that point had become incredibly um, active in securing multiple forms of federal funding outside of the Bureau of Indian Affairs, kind of historic, kind of um, single-party governing system. And the Johnson and uh, Nixon and Carter administrations had opened up all kinds of divisions of federal funding for tribes that subsequently got reduced heavily. And there's some sociological studies that suggest that Native Americans' per capita income declined throughout the 1980s from the 1970s, which would be a radically distinction from other American social communities. Radically distinct, given Mm -hmm. our general understandings of the boom of the 80s more broadly. But because of these dependencies on federal funding, many tribal communities had outstanding loans or underdeveloped projects and were then seeking other forms of revenue, many of which were from either black market or kind of economically um, risky types of adventures. And Congress essentially uh, had to begin regulating this. And so the Indian American Indian Gaming Regulatory Act, which is discussed in the end of chapter 12, kind of is this kind of yet again, new kind of congressional an effort to resolve a problem that uh, came out of a Supreme Court case um, and uh, had no one had any idea at the time of its passage in 1988 uh, that this hundred million dollar industry would become a multi-billion thereafter. 500 years is a lot of territory to cover in a single book. I'm going to go back to something you say early in the introduction, which is, you know, where does the history, where does the story of America start, right? Where does it start? Obviously, you pick a time and a period where, you know, the Spaniards are first arriving and everything else, but has your idea of where our history starts shifted because of this book? I would say in part. And it's partly a reflection of my own kind of professional commitments and training. Given the fact that Native American history was not well institutionalized when I started becoming a professional historian, given the fact that I've had to kind of teach uh, the subject often without like well institutionalized textbooks and things, there is a kind of difficulty bringing the pre-Columbian archaeological world into conversation with the early American post-encounter narrative and world. And so I was unable to satisfy my own commitments early on in this project to give more than kind of lip service to the pre-Columbian experience. So I do have the maps, I do have kind of references throughout early chapters, but this is not a book about the settlement of North America before European encounter. And so in a sense, I might say, where does the history of America begin 
it begins in some portion, in some large portion with encounter. And maybe that paradigm can be expanded, expanded back, you know, several mm -hmm. millennium, you know, at various times, maybe it can be uh, rehabilitated, maybe it can be rejected. Others can kind of move into the space as some have already. But I've, I've reviewed and read and taught enough in this field to see that even when scholars make a commitment to doing pre-Columbian Native American history, it is usually just a very, very brief kind of prologue or kind of incidental beginning to some other subject. And it, I think we lose a kind of focus by diminishing several, several millennia long subjects to short paragraphs. It just feels insufficient as a kind of um, narrative and or mm -hmm. methodological approach. And so I'm comfortable with this project mm -hmm. in its formation, but I understand that limitation. For me as a reader, as a layperson, it was really helpful to have guardrails. I needed a, a sort of structure that helped me sort of challenge my memories of what I was taught and also my experience of American history simply based on geography. I mean, I grew up in Massachusetts. I, you know, live in New York most of the time now. I spend a lot of time in Los Angeles. So if you think of how those cities sort of come out of the American narrative, mm -hmm. right? Like New York kind of exists because of French trade and the British and everything, like, and the Dutch, obviously. But of all the places that we've left out, you know, a large piece of Native story, I mean, that's that's a city and certainly Los Angeles. I mean, how many tribes does California have? A hundred plus? It, that's correct. And okay. uh, San Diego County has more uh, federally recognized tribes than any other county in the United States. I did not know that. Right. And so very few people, even California, know that. The, I mean, they're relatively small, uh, obviously, right. compared to uh, states like, you know, New Mexico or South Dakota. Or, but there are, you know, that's why I like the map so much in this book. I, I even mentioned them, as you may remember from the National I was just like, I, I can't believe it. Here we are. And thank you so much, uh, people who helped me. Uh, I think having that visual asset, though, I mean, I, I spent a lot of time with those maps. I spent a lot of it. And I will say having the illustrations was very helpful and the paintings and everything else. Hugely helpful to sort of orient me in time and space in a different way. But the maps, I needed to sit with those for a while. And I think there's also a map, too, where you're literally shooting down across the globe and then the way the continents appear. Right. That it map is, is taken from another study. More that I did modify it a bit. We did our team, but um, those in maps are really important to me. The first real history book I ever read as a, a college student uh, was a supplemental text to a year long course on the Second World War. And I didn't for some reason like the books that the, were assigned for that. And I just felt like I needed something else. And I was extremely fortunate to take this class at that time of my life and career. And so I found a copy of a book called The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich by William Shire. Oh, okay. Which is considered like the journalistic classic account of the rise and fall of the Third Reich from an American journalist stationed in Berlin. I mean, it had this kind of dramatic narrative and kind of set of like informed biographies and it was heavily, easy, you know, it made it clouded my understanding of the Second World War as a global subject matter because it was largely rooted in, you know, the Reich and Nazi expansion. But that book had in its front and in papers in the hardback these incredible maps that just mm -hmm. show the extent of European of Nazi rule that, you know, literally stretched from Iberia to, you know, the Arctic Circle, you know, across continental Europe, all the way almost to the Volga. You know, and May just kind of brought like the reality of that subject to mind visually at a time when, you know, there was no Internet and there was no real media to turn to for history. Um, and I just have always, you know, valued maps for those types of reasons and tried in my own ways to bring them into my own work. You did. You definitely did. And uh, I'm really looking forward to more readers getting their hands on the rediscovery of America. But where do we go from here? Where do you go from here as a historian, but also where do we go as Americans with a collective story? Well, you know, I didn't anticipate this when I was writing this project because it took many, many years and came in various forms. But we are about to begin a pretty sustained 
engagement with the nation's founding in a way that we haven't seen since I was five, when the bicentennial right. was like on quarters and uh, you know fireworks were happening. Um, in 2026, we will return to a 250th commemoration of the birth of the American Republic. And I've started seeing the, the declaration um, in a kind of broader context in my more re uh, talks and research and publications, because it doesn't seem as central as it should be to this narrative. And so I think I might spend some time in the next few years um, talking about the declaration. Uh, we'll be you know, looking at the Constitution, and I don't know where I'll be, you know, in 20, uh, 2037, but, you know, that will be the 250th anniversary of the Constitution. Uh, I think we need to prepare ourselves to essentially move forward in the 21st century with more kind of informed and kind of shared uh, kind of common understandings of our nation in ways that are not combative or polarized or polarizing. Uh, but that are kind of work uh, rooted in a, an ambition to work towards collaboration and uh, shared uh, futures, because, you know, the crises of our times are going to need, um, you know, informed, reasoned, analytical and um, patient, you know, the analysts. So if we can't be those people in our own work and lives, um, we're certainly not going to be it in our national um, phases either. And that seems like a really good place to end this interview. But at the same time, before I let you go, <laughs> is there anything you really want to talk about in, in terms of the rediscovery of America that somehow we didn't? We are leaving out some bits so people can discover on their own when they read. There's quite a lot of fantastic material and great storytelling in this book. It won the National Book Award for obvious reasons. But just in case, before I let you go. You know, I um I think we we did cover a lot of ground. I appreciate, you know, the inquiry around, you know, my own background and training. Um I will say just if anyone has some modest um additional interest and or adventurous kind of perhaps uh, uh predilections. Um I did work on not just the West, but my own tribe and kind of uh, family's kind of homelands in my first work. And so there's a lot less of me in a sense or my biography in ways that might um, others might be interested in learning about. Because how did um, a kid from Detroit who's half Shoshone and half white um, end up uh, writing this book about Native America? Uh, some of that might be found in my first book, which is called Violence Over the Land. Um, it's about the Great Basin, the region east of California and west of Colorado that uh, I also spent many, many years trying to make sense of. And that's the beauty of story and that's the beauty of history. We get to make sense of stuff. And story is how we organize all of that information. And it's really great to have access to. It's really, really great. Ned Blackhawk, thank you so much for joining us on Port Over. This was terrific. I cannot wait for other people to get their hands on the rediscovery of America. Thanks again. It's been my real uh, distinct pleasure to talk with you. Thank you for listening. Port Over is a Barnes & Noble production. To help other readers find us, please rate and review the show wherever you listen to podcasts.